next speaker is, uh, we are now coming to art, finally. Uh, next speaker is Julie Olt, uh, and the title is Rear View Vision, History Enthusiasm and History Anxiety. Julie Olt is an artist, writer, who often, as I found it, assumes curatorial and editorial roles as forms of artistic practice. Her wor work emphasizes interrelationships between cultural production and politics. Julie Olt is one of the co-founders of the New York-based artist collaborative group Material. She has lectured at numerous institutions, including L'Ecole Supérieure d'Art Visuel in uh, Geneva, Geneva Univer University of California, Los Angeles, Center for Curatorial Studies, Bard College, etc. As a collaborative artist, she works with the artist Martin Beck on their context contextual research projects. They focus on the problem of the conservation and presentation of knowledge and culture and more concretely, they explore, for instance, the question which aspects of knowledge and cultural practice are excluded from the official historiography and why. This is the problem also we will discuss uh, today. Please, okay. the floor is yours. Thank you. getting myself gathered. Sorry, I thought we were taking a little break in between, and I just learned that we weren't, so I'm jumping in here. Um, as you'll see from my talk, I don't have, uh, I don't have a grounding in the, in the history of the theoretical conceptions of Horizon, and um, nor am I equipped to talk about the political stage, the world political stage, as we just heard. What I'm going to do is talk about, um, like say, zoom in to a very specific art practice and take up the notion of horizon in relation to exhibition making and through a couple of examples, talk about the notion of horizon and its relationship to history through these very um, specific examples. And um, I also want to preface this by thanking the organizers of this for inviting me for the opportunity to speak, but more for the opportunity to listen to all the other speakers, which is quite a luxury, um, a luxury to be able to do that. This talk explores relationships between artistic practice, the archive, historical representation, and communicative method, and tussles with the question of how history and horizon are interrelated. I will focus on four specific projects, each of which engaged historical inquiry as both theme and form, and made use of the archive to materialize historical conditions, events, and information in order to render them present. Presentation is integral to their effectivity, or more specifically, customized apt presentation. These endeavors also reflect multiple modes of authorship. The first is a collaborative exhibition by Group Material from 1989, the second is an artwork made with Martin Beck in 2003. The third is a recently published book that I organized about group material. And the fourth is another artwork with Beck from this year. As you see, I'm trying to pack a lot into a 40-minute talk. Um, situation one, history as present tense horizon. Group material's work was primarily topical and temporal fueled by our personal and collective observations and by the social urgencies that we perceived. Our horizon was the present tense. In 1989, Larry Rinder, curator at the Berkeley University Museum, invited us to engage the subject of AIDS after seeing our exhibition at the Dear Art Foundation the year before, titled AIDS and Democracy, a Case Study. At the time, group material consisted of Felix Gonzalez Torres, Doug Ashford, Karen Ramsbacker, and myself. By 1989, we had witnessed a decade of the epidemic with se severely inadequate public response. The accumulation of AIDS-related illnesses and deaths of young friends and colleagues informed our daily lives. As much for our own edification as for public purpose, the group embarked on constructing a history of the conditions that transformed the pandemic into a full-blown national crisis. Along with intern Richard Meyer, we researched events and developments in several arenas. 
medical and scientific industries, governmental policies and statistics, grassroots responses and activism by those communities most affected by AIDS, media representations of AIDS, artistic responses, and popular culture of the relevant periods. The resulting exhibition was composed of selected artifacts and documentary material from these fields that were cut together with artworks by individuals and collectives in a chronological structure. A thick black line bifurcated the display, marking its temporal horizon, beginning with 1979, the year the Centers for Disease Control, the CDC, started tracking cases and deaths due to a new immune suppressive virus and extended into the then present 1989. The increasing number of new AIDS cases and deaths each year were presented on the timeline. A text composed of information curated by the group from the same research arenas ran close to the line. Actually, I'm going to start our images. The documentary material was keyed to the timeline, as were some of the more directly pertinent artworks. Other oblique and metaphorical works were not anchored to points in time. At first glance, the timeline format promoted a linear reading. However, once one got involved with the material, the histories and stories and images, cross-referencing was inevitable. AIDS timeline's ingredients were presented not as disparate elements or facts, but as a web of intertwined events in order to describe social processes and to demonstrate the actions, that actions and events have consequences on and interconnections with other actions and events. Virtually all the major social inequities that compromise democracy in the US were reflected in the decade-long history of AIDS. The group's arrangement of information posited a history of the politi political and social conditions in which AIDS was not only allowed, but was encouraged to become a national crisis. And it broadcast some exemplary responses that were made in the arms of that crisis. The timeline related the widespread, widespread stigmatization of people with AIDS to public opinion, demonstrating the link between representation and judgment between representation and allocation of resources, and it documented the impact that homophobia, racism, heterosexism, and sexism had, this one you can't see, sorry, on the formation of effective public policy. AIDS Timeline proposed a model of history writing, model of curatorial method, artistic practice, social process, and a compound of temporal context joined together. The exhibition sought to contextualize the AIDS crisis and to create a context itself, a didactic exhibitory environment that examined recent events in order to account for present conditions with the hope to influence what was to come. Sabrina Locks has written, an exhibition can function, however provisionally, intentionally or not, as a prescriptive, presentation of history, or, as in the case of AIDS timeline, as a call to amend its course. Agency was our horizon, and history, not only that of the 80s, but history as continuum, extending earlier than 1979 and going indefinitely. Chronology as a guiding device set a linear horizon and performed an anchoring purpose, acting as a focus from which viewers' perspectives could venture Within such a setup, Horizon is endowed with a double function of systematizing and releasing information. The Horizon opened views to what was above and below the timeline, to a larger set of conditions articulated by the arrangement of information brought into narrative armature so that the far-reaching associations between political and cultural events that convey the historical period would be legible. This image is outside of the museum, on the exterior of the Berkeley uh, University Museum. While the AIDS timeline was on display inside, we organized a set of um, large-scale posters that were derived, the statements on these posters were derived from interviews that Group Madero did with students and with people in the immediate area 
prior to the exhibition, asking simple questions like, how has AIDS affected your life? And then we also interviewed a number of um, people that worked for advo advocacy organizations and community organizations involved in the AIDS crisis, and then juxtaposed those with the individual statements in order to give the institution a kind of multivocal face on the, on the exterior. In recent years, several curators have inquired about reconstructing group material exhibitions, in particular, AIDS Timeline. What would it take to recreate it? Is this, in fact, possible? Can such a horizon be reconstructed? In principle, one could gather the artworks and artifacts that compose the exhibition from the archive and from other sources and install them according to photographs of the original manifestation. Most of the more ephemeral matter was saved and now sits in Group Materials Archive at NYU in New York. Artworks were returned to the participants and lenders, but most are locatable. Would such a material reunion in fact constitute AIDS timeline and its conceptualization of horizon? One has to take into account what would be missing. Aesthetic practice and social practice merged in the project which involved layers of collaboration in and beyond the group with many individuals and community advocacy organizations. These integral social relations would be absent. Group materials exhibitions spoke from and to particular contexts and to particular moments. Contexts cannot be replicated. It is impossible to reproduce the climate of circumstance and perception and understanding for events or the complexity of the period, the biases, the conventions, or the emotions. Collective knowledge and memory composed a vital dimension of the exhibition, which has since dispersed and transformed. There I'm talking about collective knowledge and memory of the viewers of the audience, not only of the makers of the exhibition. The pressing character of the, and the of the moment relationship to AIDS has also changed dramatically as urgencies have migrated across geographies and constituencies. History as Horizon was conceived as an active field linking to the present. It seems to me that retrieving AIDS timeline would fossilize it as an exhibition scale artifact and relocate the horizon to a strict notion of past. Perhaps drawing on the methods, principles, and format that the group used to, to create instead a contextual history of AIDS rooted in the present might vivify the practice. But then again, GM's practice was also contingent on conditions and purpose and necessity, so it follows that current circumstances call for another approach. An abstract question for me emerges, what composes the present in any presentation? Situation two, horizon is history of dispute. Social Landscape, a work made in collaboration with Martin Beck, also employed a chronographic format. In 2002, Martin and I were invited by curator Ron Platt to participate in an exhibition about poverty titled Born of Necessity at the Weatherspoon Museum in Greensboro, North Carolina. We wanted to contextualize poverty at the threshold of the exhibition and identified the exterior perimeter wall of the large-scale gallery where the exhibition would take place and its flanking entrances as our preferred site. We took the U.S. governmental poverty line as our research subject. The poverty line divides those who are designated poor from those who are not. The poverty line is a concrete and symbolic parameter used for judging financial eligibility for federal assistance programs for preparing statistical estimates of the number of Americans living in poverty each year and for measuring the country's economic well-being. Since its inception in 1963, the official U.S. poverty measure defines poverty lines according to before-tax income levels using an economy food plan that is designed for temporary or emergency use when funds are low. Adopted by President Johnson's administration in 1964, it is virtually unrevised to this day. A fundamental issue in the ongoing debate about measuring poverty is whether poverty lines should be updated in absolute or in relative fashion. 
Absolute measures operate with the logic that there is a calculable, nationally uniform survival level of income, below which people should be considered economically deprived. The current U.S. official measure is an absolute one that attempts to define a subsistence standard and has thresholds that remain constant over time, only updated for inflation. On the other hand, relative poverty lines define poverty in terms of comparative economic disadvantage and are assessed against evolving standards of living. Implicit in the relative poverty measure is the assumption that people need more than basic nutrition. That, these resources are, that those whose resources are significantly below others, even if they are physically able to survive, may not be able to participate adequately in social organizations or in society. Almost since its adoption in 1963, the poverty measure system has been awaiting a major overhaul. A plethora of alternative income definitions and calculation methods have been proposed by governmental and non-governmental agencies alike. One of the major criticisms is that the poverty levels reflect consumption patterns from the early 1960s. Neither do they take into account how regional differences determine income needs or new estimations of what is required to live in society. The primary reason for leaving the poverty measures intact using this absolute measure, despite that they are outdated, is to create the illusion that fewer U.S. citizens are poor than is actual. Alternative measures show much higher poverty rates than the official line indicates. For example, when we did this project in 2003, 12.7% of the population was poor, according to the official measure, when using a relative measure, 23.7% of the U.S. population was estimated to live in poverty. Now it would be more like 26%. Martin Beck and I translated our research into a diagram of the relationship between absolute and relative poverty ratios between 1963 and 2003. We produced a supersized floor-to-ceiling mural that required people walk its 40-foot length Gosh, I don't know how much that is in meters. Simon, do you know? Uh, 40 feet, 12 meters? Okay. Um, sorry. We produced a supersized floor to ceiling mural that required people walk its 40 foot length in order to apprehend the dip depicted relationship of economic discrepancy over time. Another chart on the mural, starting in 1979, which is way down in the, on the wall, traced the increasing incomes of taxpayer groups and showed the dramatically widening income gap between rich and poor. We scaled the information to create a visually immersive experience that would effectively place viewers inside of the discourse, offering a situation where they were able to physically locate themselves on a stratified economic field. The poverty line as a contested device formed a literal and symbolic horizon. The mural framed the curated exhibition it was a part of and was visible from the museum's other permanent collection galleries, literally functioning as a horizon-like background of economic issues made evident. The central horizon was conceptualized, uh, conceptualized as the correlation between the two contours representing absolute and relative poverty measures proportional change indicating the disputed history of domestic economy, which was then graphically linked with the widening income gap, pointing toward a more remote horizon, the larger system in which poverty is structural. The work put forward this ongoing conflict in order to stimulate critical perspectives in viewers. We have since regenerated this work on four other occasions under the title Information. Updating the information and tailoring the painting spatially and visually each time. I don't have images of all of them, so I'll show you just one more. This was its storefront for art and architecture in 2006, and you see it from the exterior. Situation three, chronicle as horizon. After the New York-based artist collaborative group material disbanded in 1996, I continued its representation through live narration and, and writings. As the only founding member who remained until its conclusion, I felt a responsibility to keep recounting the group's practice. Long-term member Doug Ashford has done likewise. 
Group Material was founded in 1979 by a group of friends who wanted to combine their political and aesthetic interests and forge a collective practice in production. After its first year operating a storefront gallery in New York City's Lower East Side, the group continued independently, creating exhibitions in public places such as subways, the street, and newspapers, and in existing institutions ranging from alternative spaces to major museums. Our medium was the temporary exhibition through which models of social and representational structures were posited and rules, situations, and venues were often subverted. When the group ceased its activities in 1996, I was intent on preserving its ephemerality, on not becoming history. Fearing a revisionist re-encapsulation in which conflicts and contradictions of collaboration are resolved in their representation, I resisted our work being defined and objectified in a monograph or retrospective by an art historian and reserved the right to cohere our history at some future point. Three years ago, I decided it was time to relinquish control and responsibility and address group materials history with lasting effect. I needed to confront the material traces that had infiltrated every closet, cabinet, and spare spot in my apartment, as well as the psychic traces that permeated memory. Collecting material saved by other group material members as well and joining it all together in an archive would permit access to GM in a more coherent way than had been possible before and open the door for further inquiry and representation. Tackling the mission of recuperating group material involved gathering and organizing the archive and simultaneously distilling that body of information in order to make a book. While formalizing the archive sought to make group material newly public, the process was also conceived as a testing space in which to investigate the logic, structure, and practice of the archive. Each aspect of cohering the archive and making the publication, which is this here, show and tell a chronicle of group material, embodied specific and abstract purpose. A set of vexing questions fueled the endeavor, including, how does bringing documentation together imply shaping and writing history? How do artifacts communicate? What archival structure and practices will animate and complicate without overdetermining meanings? What constitutes historical perspective? What kind of horizon is history and history writing? What kind of narration is called for here and what is the relationship between chronology and narration? What tense is the archive? If one conceives of the archive as a place for infinite use, connection, and reproduction, or as Mark Wigley purports, a space of questions rather than answers, an incubator of new life, then the archive is in principle timeless and up for grabs. Both as lived experience and in practice, history is anything but linear. Although chronology insinuates linearity and chronicle of group material, the chronicle of group material charts the interactions of numerous sequences of events and lines of inquiry, resulting in a multi-dimensional spatial representation. I'm showing you some, uh, some of the page spreads from the book. It's a few of them um, as examples of the layout. Show and Tell's main section was conceived as a chronicle composed of reprinted documents and images with a guiding text that runs throughout. The account takes its ingredients and methods from the archive, which embodies both private and public material. The making of the group as a specific context, along with its structure and process, is inseparable from its public creations. Yet the bulk of existing representation focuses on group materials projects. Show and tell widens the frame in order to include conveyance of internal workings in each layer of material that forms the book and stresses aspects of the collabor collaboration that are otherwise invisible. Trains of information such as the continuities and discontinuities of the group's composition and conflicts and contradictions endemic to its process are charted throughout. Group material comes to life in the archive. I was struck by the vividness of internal correspondence, minutes of meetings, proposals, and public statements produced in and by the group. Emotional intensity is palpable in the early communiques. 
Topics and larger debates of the times are glimpsed through language and the group's shifting rhetorical strategies. Graphic design bespeaks period styles. A selection of documents valued as original language is reprinted in their original scale and form in the book to convey what we perceived we were doing at the time. By design, the book encourages that documents be regarded, these documents be regarded as primary texts rather than ancillary illustrations. This method situates, situates readers in the archive inviting a multiplicity of interpretations. The guiding text that filters throughout uses a non-specific voice that imparts otherwise inaccessible circumstances, facts, and anecdotes alongside the archive materials. This guiding voice functions as a horizon line within the chronicle as it generates focus as well as flow. It represents a distillation of multiple documentation and composite memory of group members. The text captions, reports, digresses, and discloses, coalescing subjective and objective knowledge into a seamless voice. A depersonalized present tense mode is used, intended to situate readers in the times of events and to suggest collective subjectivity, distinct from first person retrospection or the idea of a grand narrator, or the idea of a post post position. A layer of diverse extracts also filters throughout, varying in author length and style that are unified by typographic design treatment. Snapshots portraying the various members and incarnations of the group and formal installation photography are presented on equal footing. The goal was to bring the elements into a carefully designed system that stresses all inclusions as primary and equivalent. Analogous to the decentralized thematic exhibition format that the group advanced, the Chronicle is thought of as an exhibition space in the form of a book. Show and Tell offers a representation of the group's strata of process. It is also a source for hard data, impression, and historical atmosphere. Interpretive tendencies have been restrained within the book in favor of creating a useful documentary foundation. Upon receiving the first copy of Show and Tell, I experienced a combination of contentment, elation, and regret. A part of me lamented taking the road of conservation that making a book implies, instead of leaving what was ephemeral, ephemeral, if only to harbor an illusion of radicalism. New questions arise. What does it mean to now have group material as an object? After so many years of being nomadic and indeterminate, what does it mean for group material to occupy a location in the archive as well as on the bookshelf? to have this neat package which answers the question, what was group material? Second thoughts were ultimately trumped, however, by belief in the consequences of advancing collaborative models of artistic production, and in taking up the challenge of creating a fitting representational form for this practice that had not yet been formally historicized. Group material had been on the verge of becoming history since it ceased its activities 14 years ago. Cohering the archive was bound to lead to GM being committed to print one way or another, and Show and Tell accomplishes a first uncompromised articulation while fertilizing the research terrain that others will travel. That this self-historicization took the form of, of a publication was in part a necessity, given that the ways in which cultural forces determine the induction of peripheral activities into lasting art discourse. While I began the project thinking it would be an ending, I realized that the opposite is true. Group material is revivified and its history is just beginning insofar as history replies history writing. The archive and book relocate agency from the group as working entity to others who activate its bodies of information, historical representation now being the implicit horizon. Situation four, nonstop horizon. No Stop City High Rise, a conceptual equation, is a recent work made with Martin Beck for the 29th Sao Paulo Biennale. In the late 60s and early 70s, both the Italian architecture collective Archizum Associate and the British author J.G. Ballard were immersed in investigating current urban and technological environments as well as the surging impact of consumer capitalism on the social landscape. From these studies, they envisaged a future that foretold the dissolution of familiar architectural and urban forms. 
AkiZoom's project, No Stop City, and Ballad's urban disaster narratives signpost a paradigm shift from the modern city model into one of relative formlessness, immateriality, placelessness, timelessness, and endlessness. Respectively, their works articulate perpetual isotropic expansion, which is expressed horizontally through orthogonal grid networks and vertical extension through high-rise development. The paradoxical consequences of which include acute alienation, alienation excuse me, as well as a variety of freedoms. Ballard conjured the massive transformation of social order and, for, and form engendered by technological and meteor environments in eroticized car crashes that mark the symbolic elegance of the highway system. In the spatial pockets of no man's land, traffic islands produced by auto circulation, and in the idealized order of the high rise as a dynamic force in which, quote, a new social type was being created, a cool, unemotional personality impervious to the psychological pressure of high rise life with minimal needs for privacy, who thrived like an advanced species of machine in the neutral atmosphere. Archizum Associati envisioned a reformulating urban condition through their multi-form project, No Stop City, 1969 to 1972, which was manifest in writings, drawings, and images of model landscapes. Its premise is that a city is not defined by architecture or buildings, but by infrastructure that simultaneously <coughs> enables both production and consumption. Quote, a city is a bath every 100 meters or a computer every 40 meters, etc. These are quantifiable data making up a city, end quote. In No Stop City, urbanity expands and multiplies endlessly in every direction, simultaneously demonstrating and duplicating a central feature of capitalism's grip on the social, political, and economic environment. Archizum dramatized the city's isotropic tendencies in a series of models, these are images of those models, which depict landscapes wherein the boundaries between interior and exterior and between production and consumption disappear. Inside these models, sets of consumer products, urban and natural fixtures, and workplace-like infrastructure are carefully composed and intricately mirrored, generating infinitely extending scenes from which Archizoom produced and circulated photographic representations of the system. Martin's and my aim was to activate, rather than historicize, Archizoom and Ballad's conceptualizations, to use them as a lens on the present, on Sao Paulo, for instance. We installed a drop ceiling regularly used for commercial and office space in the relevant curatorial neighborhood that our contribution was a part of, which included also projects by Archigram, Super Studio, and Graziella Kunch. We rendered the structural columns of the Niemeyer building that fall within this area reflective. The drop ceiling and the mirrored columns both derive from No Stop City, the Archizoom project, and translate that model into an exhibitory frame. A commerce referential insertion in Niemeyer's sculptural modernist construction, the ceiling literally superimposes another horizon. A vitrine holding artifacts and documents marks the published record, including diagrams and images from No Stop City, its initial publications, and first editions of Ballad's books, Crash, Concrete Island, and High Rise, which is his urban disaster trilogy. Extracts from Archizoom and Ballad's writings that bespeak a nonstop horizon of cultural extension are mounted in the nearby windows, superimposing there is urban philosophies onto the city. I'll read you a brief quote from that. Um, these are the quotes in the window looking over Sao Paulo's uh, cityscape. For Archizoom, quote, the city no longer represents the system, but becomes the system itself, programmed and isotropic. And within it, when it, within it the various functions are contained homogeneously without contradictions. Production and consumption possess one and the same ideology, which is that of programming. Both hypothesize a social and physical reality, completely continuous and undifferentiated. No other realities exist. The factory and the supermarket become the specimen models of the future city, 
optimal urban structures potentially limitless where hum human functions are arranged spontaneously in a free field made uniform by the system, end quote. And in another window nearby, which you see here, um, Noon Talk on Millionth Street. This is from J.G. Ballard's story. Noon Talk on Millionth Street. Sorry, these are the West Millions. You want 97,753,335th Street East. Dollar five a cubic foot, sell. Take a westbound express to 495th Avenue, cross over to a red line elevator, and go up a thousand levels to Plaza Terminal. Carry on south from there and you'll find it between 568th Avenue and 472nd Street. There's a cave-in down at Kent County, 50 blocks by 20 by 30 levels. Have you seen those new intercity sleepers? They take only 10 minutes to go up 3,000 levels." End quote. This is an image of uh, our, our project, No Stop City High Rise, seen from the outside of the Niemeyer building with its uh, drop ceiling and lighting system installed. In all these cases that I've described, deciphering and cross-wiring documents and information engender the apprehension of history as horizon. How do the forms employed animate the histories that they stage? Materializing Archizum and Ballad's critical perspectives had to take the form of enactment. The configuration of exhibited elements performs a scene of perpetuity positioning audience point of view to contemplate present socio and spatial conditions of infinite urbanity. Charting for the record the processes and the conditions, the contradictions and projects of group materials practice had to be a book which translates the group's exhibition methods and core principles into portable lasting form and posits depersonalized narration of the past as a present tense perspective. Evidencing the discrepancy between ways of measuring poverty had to be an immersive installation that viewers could physically move through to apprehend the structure and drama of economic disparity. And the account of the development of the AIDS crisis had to be a timeline situating viewers in a dense complex of information and images that they linked up and built narratively. The practices of archiving and historical investigation and representation are contingent on purpose and situation. What makes sense in principle is that research methods, archiving practices, interpretive means, form finding, as well as communicative modes be taken up anew in relation to each case of historical discovery and recuperation. Each complex of ephemeral histories demands its own representational method and form. From this perspective, formulaic engagement in any media implies treating a subject generically within predetermined confines that risk diminishing subject matter, practitioner, and viewer, reader. How far can the notion of pushing and pursuing differentiation in form and methods for each exploration of histories extend? I'm tempted to say that all histories deserve a custom-made approach, despite that this sounds unrealistic. Conclusion, this is the conclusion part. Am I doing okay on time? Okay. <laughs> Should I read faster? Archive as horizon. What kind of horizon is history now? Speaking of infinity. Carolyn Steedman has asserted, quote, the historian's massive authority as a writer derives from two factors, the way archives are and the conventional rhetoric of history writing, which always asserts that you know because you have been there. There is a story put about that the authority comes from the documents themselves and that the historian's obeisance to the limits they impose on any account that employs them. But really it comes from having been there, the train to the distant city, the call number, the bundle opened, the dust, end quote. Following Steedman, the historian's authority stems from having scrutinized actual documents made connections between them and passed judgments on their relevance as puzzle pieces in the history being shaped. Authority is awarded to she who makes the effort. The credible historian proves her worth by overcoming whatever obstacles may ensue, ensue including vast amounts of labor, personal investment, blockades to information, and the riddles embedded in the silences and gaps in the archive. Experiencing the extent of the pieces and the horizon of historicity 
its horizontality and verticality equips one with the means, if not the methods, to interpret and ultimately articulate historical perspective. However, the ceremonial character of entering and deciphering the archive evaporates as archives are digitized and at every turn made available online. But does it stand to reason that this historian's massive authority simply gets dispersed equitably in one fell swoop as formality gives way to informality and analog yields to di digital? Does the archive sustain its import when everyone can use it? What happens to the authority of the archive and of the historian? To what degree is the authority of the electronic archive undermined by the state of placenessness, eventually rendering it less influential and diminishing the role of researcher, historian, and the status of history writing in the process? What deems historical representation credible when anyone can write it? If historical representation is always in part concerned with broadcast control and galvanizing the present, in which its methods and investigation occur, does it potentially become obsolete when the archive is omnipresent and open to any and all participation? The archive is not history, but history writing and representation emerge from there. It is the site of production traditionally based on a controlled pool of sources. The archive and by extension, history writing are expanding exponentially, tongue twister, in all directions. Instant universal access to infinite information is the promise of the digital revolution in archiving. In the electronic environment where utterances, images, and e events proliferate randomly and indefinitely, will we find that the notions of archiving and history writing are eventually rendered redundant and even irrelevant? Will historical representation and the mediation of memory and annals the making and interpretation of meaning from the archive be necessary if the archive is opened so that anyone and everyone can contribute to it, access it, and construe it at any time. Historically speaking, whatever becomes history is driven by the formats that are used for its construction. The ongoing development of representational formats that construct meaningful histories is partially embedded in the potential of art practices. Art can give history form. The limits and depths of historical inquiry are not prefigured. Archives are places of increasing diversity, which are constantly, constantly infused with fresh topics and bodies of information, and hopefully with fresh methods. Thank you.